common question that we get during our initial consultation. What's the difference between a will and a trust and do I need a trust? So we'll really dive into that today. What is estate planning? Estate planning is a proactive process of putting together a plan which allows someone to carry out your wishes in the event of your incapacity or death. So we're really trying to focus on being proactive. They say the best time to do estate planning is when there is no need to do so. So I like to look at the documents in this way because it kind of gives you an idea of when they're useful, what they do. So first, you know, the will, disposition of remains, like cremation and burial, and then trust are used after death. And then also the trust is kind of a hybrid of documents. Power of attorney, healthcare directive, and Hitler release are used during your life. First of all, the will, that's the most basic document that everyone kind of thinks of when they think of an estate plan. That's where you name who gets your stuff, you know, who are your beneficiaries, what do they get. So if you have minor children, can nominate the guardian of your minor children or conservator. And then basically a will just gives you control over those things. If you don't have a will, the beneficiaries and the guardian and your personal representative those are all determined by state statute, which I probably should clarify. You know, today we're talking about the state of Hawaii. I'm licensed attorney in the state of Hawaii. Every state has different laws. And so we are only talking about Hawaii. The will is called a pour over will when you have a trust. So will versus trust is kind of a theoretical will versus a trust. But the thing is, when you have a comprehensive estate plan, you always have a will. Sometimes in addition to the will, you have a trust. When you have a trust, your will is called a pour over will because it pours over the assets into your trust that you don't already have in your trust when you die. The goal is to have certain assets in your trust while you're living to avoid probate, to have incapacity planning, and the will will pour them over and make sure everything gets to the trust and all of the beneficiary provisions are in the trust document. Now we're going to get into what a trust is because to know the difference between a will versus a trust, you have to understand what a trust is. And it's complex and so we have a few slides to walk you through. First, you have to have a purpose. You don't inherently need a trust. So a trust has to have a purpose for being created. Then there's, there are types of trust. Is it revocable? Is it irrevocable? Today we're talking about primarily revocable trusts. There has to be a trustee. That's the person who's responsible to manage whatever's in the trust. Who are the beneficiaries? They're the ones that sit back and just receive checks, receive the benefit. And then there has to be something in your trust, assets. And then when is it terminated? The trust has to terminate at some point and it'll be defined in the trust. Basically a trust is a contract. And so a trust can say anything. And we try to help you as estate planning attorneys to draft a trust that is clear and accomplishes your specific goals. So we're going to first talk about the revocable living trust uh, during your life. If you set up a trust during your life, what does your revocable trust look like? And then the next column, we're gonna look say, say what a trust looks like after your life, because it's two very different things. During your life, how can a revocable living trust help you? And that's the incapacity planning, because during your life, you and your revocable living trust are one in the same. It uses your social security number. As long as you're living with capacity, a lot of times people come into my office and I'll say, okay, you have a trust, you've had it for like say 10 years, you have this bank account, you have this home, is it in your trust? And they don't even know whether it's in their trust or not because it doesn't change how they interact with that asset. But in the event, of their incapacity, whatever assets are in their trust then get controlled by the successor trustee. So that's how trust can assist with incapacity planning during your lifetime. Grantor is the word we use. Sometimes trust will use trustor or setlor or grantor. Uh, they're all interchangeable. And when you set up a revocable living trust, you are the trustee of your own trust generally. Unless at some point, you don't want to continue or you're unable to be the trustee of your own trust, then whoever you've appointed as the next person, the successor trustee, can accept their role as the new trustee because you have either resigned or become incapacitated. 
or deceased, but that's the next column. So, and trusts have, can have a provision that says when you are deemed incapacitated, when you can be involuntarily removed as trustee of your trust. Generally, the more standard paragraph is to say if two physicians agree I lack the capacity required to perform the duties of a trustee, basically manage your own financial affairs, then you can be removed. Or you can be, or you can just resign. I like when people are more proactive, but not everyone has the opportunity or desire to resign. But if you do, then the next person steps in, they just sign a simple sentence that says, I accept my role as the new trustee because the grantor has resigned or has been deemed incapacitated. And then they become the acting trustee and they have full authority to manage whatever's in the trust. So they can get to the bank account. They can manage the real estate that's in the trust. And if they do this during your lifetime, the next line, who is the beneficiary? The grantor. So basically, they, the, new, the successor trustee is responsible to manage whatever's in the trust for you as the grantor. So as long as you're living, you don't have to be the trustee of your own trust, but you're always the beneficiary. You're not giving anything away. When you put something into a revocable living trust, it's still yours. It only changes when something's in your revocable living trust how that underlying trust property is managed in the event of your incapacity or death. And then during your life, in terms of assets, you have the option to transfer things into your trust or not. And so this is a question that people have a lot of time is, okay, I have a trust now. Should I put this bank account in it? Should I put this investment account in it? Retirement accounts cannot be put into your trust. Retirement accounts have to stay in your individual name because they have special rules and, and but you can name the trust as a designated beneficiary of a retirement account. There are lots of different ways to incorporate a revocable living trust with your assets. The first step is to set up an estate plan if it does include a revocable living trust. The second step is to figure out what assets do you want to have in your trust? Trust can terminate during your life. You can always revoke your trust. When it says revocable, that means it's amendable. You can change it at any time as long as you're living with the capacity to make decisions. And then what does the trust look like after your life? First of all, the purpose for a trust, if we're looking at after your lifetime, is generally to con control your legacy. This just means in certain circumstances, people want to make sure that what they leave behind helps the beneficiary. In some cases, when you leave something to someone, maybe it's too much. There's different scenarios where the inheritance would not help them, it would actually hurt them. So everyone, you always want an inheritance to help the beneficiary, not hurt. So then after your lifetime, the trust becomes irrevocable, it is irrevocable, however you wanna pronounce it. It cannot be changed because it's your trust and only you can change it. So then at that point, the new trustee has to come in. A lot of times the grantor is the trustee up until the point when they die. And then the new trustee says, I accept my role as the acting trustee because the grantor is deceased. That is the equivalent of probate. So if, for example, your property, uh, your real estate is in your trust, instead of going through that probate application process, it's just a simple acceptance saying, I accept my role as the new trustee and with that acceptance and the death certificate proving that grantor is no longer living that trustee now can have full access to carry out the terms of the trust whatever the trust says they should do they need to do and then who are the beneficiaries whoever the grantors want to be beneficiaries like i said earlier the trust is just a contract so the the terms of the contract will be laid out very clearly, hopefully, that say, I want this to happen, I want this to happen, I want this person to get this. And then with the assets that are not already in the trust, the will will pour them over into the trust. And so you want those assets that are being poured over into the trust because they're not held joint with rights of survivorship and they don't have designated beneficiaries. You want those assets to not trigger probate. So those assets that are being poured over should not include real estate and should 
total less, the value should total less than $100,000. And then when does it terminate? That again is the grantor's decision, whatever the grantor said in their trust, when it should terminate, that will happen. And so I'll, kind of, I'll go into these specific scenarios where I see people wanting to control their legacy. First of all, a mixed family. So if I have clients who are married, and it's a second marriage, they have children, both have children from prior marriages, also with young beneficiaries, young as in age, and sometimes young as in heart. And then a special needs trust is also where you have a beneficiary who is special needs, so they'll never be able to earn a living, and so they're receiving welfare type benefits, Medicaid benefits, and so if they inherit something from you, they will be kicked off of Medicaid, maybe displaced from the housing they're living in. And so you, and they're, they're very comfortable with that you don't want to mess with. And so if you have a beneficiary who may be receiving Medicaid benefits, welfare needs-based type benefits, you can leave them whatever amount you wanted to in a special needs trust. The special needs trust would be used to supplement the benefits they're receiving from the government but not disqualify them from receiving those. Tax planning, I wrote that in there. Trusts have been used for estate tax planning. So I don't do income tax, um, but I do estate tax. Estate tax is the death tax, where when someone dies owning enough stuff, um, the government wants to take a percentage of it. So there's an estate tax exclusion, the amount that you can have at your death without worrying or paying any estate tax. And that exclusion amount right now in the state of Hawaii is about $6 million. And if you're married, it's per spouse, so that's 12 million. So I don't often see uh, or feel <laughs> have the need to do tax planning for my clients, um, but there are some strategies that trusts can use to lessen the tax burden for individuals who have more than the estate tax exclusion amount or close to it. And then there's the probate avoidance, which I've already gone over. And then the asset protection. A lot of times people will say, oh, I have a trust, they already have it, or they want a trust because they're worried about being sued in the future and they wanna protect their assets they put into their trust. Well, a revocable living trust, like we're talking about right now, does not provide you, the grantor, with any asset protection during your lifetime. However, you can create asset protection for others with a revocable living trust after your lifetime. So in summary, a will versus a trust, in terms of the amount of time it takes for the individual who you've appointed to step in and carry out your wishes, um, pay your bills, get the money to the beneficiaries. If you do a will and your assets trigger probate, it's slower than if the assets that would have triggered probate were in trust. A will also is a public document, so you record all of that application that you sent to the registrar's office, part of the public record. And one thing you have to do as part of that probate application process is all the documents has to be sent to all of the interested parties everyone who would have inherited if there was no will. And so sometimes if you're disinheriting a child or there is an estranged family member that would be really hard to locate, you wanna avoid probate so that your personal representative doesn't have to go on this search to find this person and notify them of all the probate proceedings. Opposed to a trust administration, you, know, you just sign that, I accept my role as the trustee and trusts can be private. And then in terms of setting up a will or a trust, a will is more affordable, a trust is more expensive. So basically you're spending more to set up a trust because after your lifetime, the administration is less expensive and the, you have a trust. So I don't think that setting up a, a trust saves overall. If you look at the setup costs, the administrative fees, a lot of money. It saves time, but in terms of the overall cost, it kind of balances out. So it kind of comes down to what are your priorities? Do you want to spend more now and set up a trust to make things easier after your lifetime? Or do you want to spend less now and go through probate? Because you know they'll be spending your money anyway. They're not spending their own money on the probate proceedings and administration. So I again I'm helping people make informed decisions. 
I give you my advice on what documents best accomplish your goals, but ultimately you're making the decision based on your priorities, your goals. So hopefully you learned a little bit today. If you have any other questions, please comment below or go to our website, hawaiitrustlaw.com.